Daniel Beranger. Um, for those of you who know me, I've been a long-term contributor on the LibVert project for um, most of its existence, about 14 years now. And today we're just going to have a, a, a talk through some of the things that have been going on in LibVert in the past year, and some of the things that are gonna, you're going to be seeing in LibVert over the next year, two years, and the reasons why we're reasons why we're doing this now. So to start off with, um, let's have a quick look at a graph of, of LibVert's commit history since, since day one, basically. It was, it was started at the end of 2005, and so we've been, we've been going about 14 years. And you can see, um, we've kind of, in the, in the past 10 years, we've kind of got a, a, bit, a nice steady state of commits per year. And I've, I've split it into two, two groups here. There's people who are contributors who've been contributing to LibVert for more than one year, and people who are new contributors to LibVert in, in this year. So you can see we've got a, a fairly steady number of commits from new contributors each year, which is, that's, that's, that's good. But then if we look at the next, next slide, a, a slightly different way of looking at the metrics is to see how many different authors we have committing to LibVert each year. And in this, in this graph, we can see that we have a fairly consistent number of long-term uh, long contributors who've been involved in the project for more than one year. But the number of new contributors to the project has, has seen a bit of a decrease in the past two years. So this is obviously, this is not good to have a decreasing number of new contributors. Um, but what's interesting is to compare it with the previous graph, the actual number of commits from new contributors is staying the same. So what this means is that the new contributors that are coming to the project are writing more code per person than, the, than we were seeing in the past. So there's, there's, there's good and bad, bad aspects to that. Part of, part, part of the reason for, um, part of the reason we think there might be a, a, a decrease in new contributors is that the virtualization world is changing a lot over the past few years. Containers are getting a lot of interest and there's new ways of using KVM virtualization. And Libvert hasn't necessarily been, um, hasn't necessarily had the right feature set for these new use cases for KVM. Um, so we've had, we, we've, had, we've had a fairly stable architecture for the past 14 years with a monolithic Libvert daemon, um, our approaches to handling memory allocation, our approaches to platform portability with GNU lib. We've done a lot of refactoring over that time, but the refactoring has been what I call evolutionary. So it's been getting rid of some technical debt, but nothing that's really tackling the, some of the core architectural decisions in LibVert from the early days. Um, so we've been, we've, been, we've been very much focused on data center vert, uh, cloud vert, and desktop vert. But you will have been hearing a lot about um, new ways of using KVM such as CATA containers, where KVM is used as the containment technology for, for your container applications. You've got KubeVert, where uh, KVM is being run inside a container, so that you kind of integrate the management of VMs with the management of containers in Kubernetes. And then you've got other things like uh, micro containers, where you have um, projects like Firecracker using KVM for running um, small function, functional programs. So those, those kind of use cases that are pushing, pushing KVM in new directions and LibVert hasn't necessarily been well suited to these new directions. So we've been thinking a bit about what we can do to make LibVert more suitable for these, these new technologies and new, usages, new usage of KVM. The key, the key theme though is that LibVert needs to be sustainable over the long term. And this, this means two things. We've got, to be, we've got to be able to attract contributors to the project. So they've got to have interesting things to work on and um, cha challenging things to work on so they feel satisfied in doing something good for the Libvert project. But at the same time, Libvert has to be attractive for application developers who are building new technologies with KVM and QMU or any of the other platforms that Libvert supports. So there's, there's, there's kind of two two things we need to think about here. Um, so this, this talk, I'm gonna focus a lot on things we're doing to make LibVert more attractive for contributors, because that's where we've, we've spent a lot of time in the past year, and a lot of 
um, thought about what we're going to do in the next year. Um, I'll also mention a few changes we're making to make it more interesting for app developers, but that's more of a, we still need more thinking in, in, in that area. Um, so over the next year, we'll be thinking more about what we can do for app developers to make Libvirt more, um, more attractive. But for, for contributors, the key, the, key, the key goal here is that we want contributors to spend less time on the kind of tedious grunt work and more time working on features that actually matter for um, virtualization. So the big thing that's occupied my, my personal time over the last year has been um, tackling the libvirt daemon architecture. Those of you who are familiar with libvirt will, will know that we have traditionally had a single libvirt daemon which has run all of, all of the libvirt driver functionality in, in one monolithic process. One of, the, one of the challenges here is that if you have one misbehaving piece of functionality in, in the daemon, it affects the entire daemon. So if, if you have something go wrong in the storage code, that affects your management of the QMU virtual machines and vice versa. It's also very challenging to provide meaningful security isolation for the libvirt daemon because the range of functionality that it needs to um, expose gives it privileges or gives it means that it has, effectively has privileges that are equivalent to running as root, um, or equivalent to having a root shell. So it's, you can't really write a useful SE, SE Linux policy around that um, to confine the libvirt daemon. It also does, it also does lots of other things. Like it, one, one key example is it, it provides the remote IP access to the libvirt API. Um, that was a convenient way to do it, but it's not necessarily the best way to do it from a, from a security point of view. As we have the, 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 remote, the remote RPC interface exposed directly to the IP sockets, and as I mentioned, the libvirt daemon's functionality is equivalent to running a root shell, so you, you've got a very direct attack surface there to, if you're exposing it over IP. So we've, we've, we've split up the libvirt daemon into lots of smaller daemons, basically one daemon per functional area in libvirt. Um, so we've got a, a QMU daemon, a Zen daemon, um, a network daemon, a firewall daemon, and, and several others. We've also got a separate thing called the, the libvirt proxy daemon, and this is, this is responsible for providing remote IP-based access to the libvirt API, so it's a completely separate process um, exposes it over the network and then proxies through to the appropriate um, modular daemon. Although all of this code is committed to libvirt and, and in the most recent release, we've not actually activated it by default, so you'll, st you'll still see the monolithic libvirt daemon if you use it today unless you've taken specific steps to opt in to the modular daemons. We think we'll probably, um, we'll probably switch over to using the modular daemons by default in the, in the early part of next year. From an application developer's point of view, this should be completely transparent. There's no, there's no change in the APIs that we're exposing. Um, or the only, the only place where it will impact you is if you've got deployment or configuration tools. So if you've got something that's building a container image containing libvirt, um, you'll want to um, change your container image recipe to run a different daemon or, or set of daemons. If you've got Ansible or Puppet scripts for configuring libvirt, you might need to make them poke at different configuration files than you would have in the past. So the application API is unchanged, but there are still some, still some impacts on the deployment level. The next uh, fairly recent change that we've done is, um, is in our approach to handling memory allocation We've uh, traditionally taken the approach of attempting to catch all errors from, from any, any API call we make, and that includes memory allocation errors. So we, we, attempted, to, we attempted to catch the, the, the Eno mem case when, when the OS runs out of memory. But in practice, most of you know that Linux doesn't really ever return an Eno mem from a malloc call because it's, it overcommits, and if it starts running low on memory, then it'll just set the OOM killer out and reap some poor unfortunate process. 
So we get a lot of complexity in the code from attempting to handle memory failures, which will almost never happen in practice on Linux. Other OSs are different, but um, even considering that, it's difficult to test this kind of memory allocation um, failure handling. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of different code paths there, and we have done work in the test suite so that we can simulate memory allocation failures. And when we do that, we detect quite a significant number of bugs in the cleanup paths. And given that the test suite only handles this much code out of this much total, we've got, we don't really have high confidence that the code base as a whole will correctly handle out of memory failures. So we, we can't really deliver on what we were promising there. So to cut a long story short, we basically decided the best thing to do is just to abort on, on out of memory failures and then gracefully handle restarting of the libvirt daemon. And this is good because we need to handle graceful restarting of the libvirt daemon anyway so that we can deal with software upgrades. So it kind of moves, moves both scenarios onto the same well-tested code path and reduces the, ultimately reduces the burden on the libvirt maintainers so that they can spend less time worrying about complex code cleanup paths and more time just working on the features that matter. <clears throat> Uh, closely, re closely related to that, um, oh, what's going on there? Closely related to that, uh, for a, for a few years now, Libvirt has mandated the use of either GCC or CLang as the compiler. Those are available on basically every operating system that matters to Libvirt, uh, more QMU today. So, with that in mind. We, we, have, we have some freedom to make use of extensions to the C language, which are supported by GCC and CLang. And the most, the most interesting extension um, that we see there is the ability to do automatic cleanup of, of, of allocated memory. So there's a, a fairly ugly syntax um, for um, annotating a variable declaration to say that when this variable goes out of scope, automatically run this function. And the classic reason for running a function is to just call the free API to reduce, uh, reduce to, to release a block of uh, memory. So this is, this is good because it's, it eliminates a whole bunch of code paths. We don't have to, we don't have, to um, have a whole bunch of go-to jumps to a cleanup block at the end to make sure that memory is always freed in the right, in the right place. So we get a much, a much simpler flow, flow through the code and in doing these conversions, we've found a number of cases where we've fixed memory leaks by doing this. So it's, it's, it's overall, it's, it's, a really, it's a really big win for code complexity and reliability of the system. Um, and it's not just, it's not just um, useful for releasing memory. It, it can also be used for uh, closing file handles. It can be used for releasing reference counts that are held on objects or unlocking mutexes you might you might hold. So it's, it's a, whole, a whole bunch of potential use cases, all of which serve to simplify the code, improve its reliability, and reduce the burden on the maintainers. And um, QMU has actually adopted the same usage very recently um, for, the, for this, exactly the same reasons as this. Um, looking, looking at... Uh, Looking at the way Libvirt is written historically, we've kind of we've targeted the fairly low-level POSIX API in general. This is this is a standard in some sense, but in practice, there is a lot of optional functionality in the POSIX spec. There's a lot of stuff that's undocumented behavior. A lot of operating systems don't uh, follow the POSIX standard very well, so it's not particularly it's not a particularly attractive API to to target. So. We've used the GNU lib project to paper over some of these differences or paper over some of the cracks between the different operating systems. This was particularly good for Windows, but there's a, there's a limit to how far it can go. Um, it's, some things are just too different between Windows and Unix operating systems for GNU lib to do a good job at. So Lib Libvert has also added a bunch of its own internal higher level APIs for, for dealing with things like sockets and um, main event loops and, and all the other kind of things you would typically see in a 
standard library for a, for a language. The C, C really suffers from not having a higher level standard library that is used everywhere that you, you kind of see in, in almost every other modern language. So it results in a lot of, a lot of wheel reinvention in, in applications that are written in C or in libraries that are targeting C. So with that in mind, we, we decided it was, it was kind of overdue to um, try and reuse some existing solutions out here. And glib is a library that's been used for Q, QMU for quite a few years now. So this is attractive to libvert because um, where, where possible, we'd like to have kind of alignment on technical, technical decisions between QMU and libvert so that someone contributing to QMU if they come to libvert, they have familiarity with the libvert code and the libraries it uses. So, so picking glib is a, is a really natural choice for libvert because it just aligns well with QMU. We previously, the, previously the only real, real reason we avoided glib is because it aborts on, on out of memory conditions. But since we decided that's okay for libvert, that's no longer a blocker. Um, so this is, this is something that was just um, adopted in libvert in the past, uh, Past, in the past month, and um, so we're going through a period of, of changing over a lot of existing libvert code to use the glib APIs, discarding libvert code that we no longer need. That's, this is going to be an this is going to be an ongoing thing over over year, two years, longer. Because at the same time as we're adopting glib, we've got to do useful work on things that matter to applications. So we can't just spend our whole time rewriting stuff for no functional gain um, from an application point of view. But over the long term, that will give us more, more time to work on interesting vert features because we have less, less time worrying about platform portability uh, problems. Next, I want to talk about uh, programming languages. Libvert is written in C. But if you look at the Libvert code base, you find, well, hey, there's all these other languages in, in, in the code. We've got Python, Perl, Shell. I mean, how many scripting languages do you really need in one project? Um, so we kind of, we, we, we want to reduce the burden on contributors. If you come to Libvert now, you have to, if you want to, certain, certain types of problems, you need to have knowledge of a really large number of different languages. And this is not very good for new contributors. So we want to try and, boil it down to one, um, one language for each kind of, each kind of logical job. So, so if, if we need shell scripting in the build system, we want to standardize on using Python for that and not using shell and Perl. Um, Python has better familiarity around contributors that we see. For the build system, we're using autoconf and auto, auto make, and that, that involves you having to know four or five different languages, some of which are really quite horrific if you've ever used M4, for example. Um, for documentation, we use a mixture of HTML, Markdown, XSL. Um, QMU has started using um, RST for its documentation, and so that's kind of a natural choice for libvert, so we get alignment there. And RST is also a natural choice for Python developers, so it's kind of, it's kind of all, all kind of aligns in that way. So you, you'll, see, you'll see over the time, we, kind of, we want to consolidate on a, on a smaller number of languages that are, that are chosen, to be, chosen to be friendly to contributors. This is, this is one, of the, one of the features that's really targeting application developers. The Libvert design has kind of targeted the kind of traditional use cases where you have data center vert or cloud vert, um, um, desktop vert, where you just want to manage a list of VMs, you're running some operating systems in them, but there's a whole range of use cases where you're really using virtualization as an, as an embedded service technology. Um, LibGuestFS has been around for a very long time doing this. Um, and it, it uses LibVert successfully, but it's, it, it also hits some problems where LibGuestFS's usage interferes with what the, the OpenStack or Overt do, so Overt or OpenStack have to explicitly, explicitly ignore VMs created by LibGuestFS, and it's, it's not ideal. So we want to introduce, introduce a new way of using LibVert, which we're calling the embedded driver. And in this case, the, dri the QMU driver code from LibVert runs in your own application process. There's no separate daemon. Um, so, so your usage of QMU is invisible to other applications on the host. It does mean that you can't use 
tools like VerisH for interacting with it, but if you're using VMs in an embedded scenario, that doesn't really matter so much. Um, and all the state related to this embedded driver is, is isolated in, in your own private directory subtree. So it's, it's we, think that, we think this could be a new interesting, interesting way of using libvirt um, for ap some, ap some applications. Going back to the topic of, of, of programming languages, there was, there, was a, there was a talk by Microsoft at the start of this year and, and some blog posts they put out looking at, looking at their security vulnerabilities and analyzing the vulnerabilities they've, they've seen. Approximately 70% of all of their security vulnerabilities are directly um, memory safety errors. So heap corruption, stack corruption, use after free, all the other things you can do wrong with memory management in C. And despite better compilers, better diagnostics, better static analysis tools, they've seen no change in that percentage of, of flaws over more than 12 years. So it's clear that writing, writing C in a way that is um, safe from memory management errors is not possible for, for humans, at least. So when, when, when LibVirt started, I mean, this, this is not a new problem by any means. It's been, it's been fairly well known for a long time. But when, when LibVirt started, um, it was still the natural choice for a, a fairly low-level systems programming um, task. Other common languages in, like, 2005, Java is fairly common, but it has a high memory overhead, and it's not good accessibility from other programming languages. Python ob obviously has been around for a very long time, but it's, it has kind of limited performance and very poor scalability across, if you want to do concurrent execution because of its global interpreter lock. So C was kind of, it was, it was, it was one of our only choices at the time, but but these days, we've got some very compelling new languages, um, most notably Rust and Golang. <coughs> and we think these, these give a performance um, and memory footprint that's close or equivalent or even in some cases exceeding C. Um, but with a kind of, at least in the Golang case, you get, you get some of the simplicity of Python. So it makes it good for new contributors to the project. Both of these languages are fairly young, but they're um, developing very quickly. We can see them growing and the communities and libraries around them maturing rapidly. Um, so I, th I think that um, even for a systems programming tasks now, C is no longer the sensible default choice. Um, even if your application is currently written in C, it's, it's compelling to think about um, adopting the use of these new languages. So o over the next uh, year or so, we're going to be talking about and looking about how we can adopt either Rust or Golang or both in Libvirt in some way. We haven't decided which of these or how we're going to adopt them, but um, it'll be targeted adoption in specific areas. We don't want to just rewrite everything for the sake of rewriting. There has to be some kind of clear benefit when we do decide to rewrite something. Um, and it'll be a long-term project, five, ten years, indefinitely. There's kind of no end, end point. Because we still need to develop important features for application developers whilst doing this. We can't just say no new features for ten years whilst we rewrite this. It's, that's not viable. I mentioned the auto tools build system earlier. It's, you have to know at least six or seven different languages to be proficient in it. Um, you will still end up calling out to Perl, Python for doing other more complex things. And it's just, it's a very large burden for contributors and it's poorly understood even by our long-term contributors. The configure script that you get from auto tools, libvirt it currently clocks in at almost two megabytes in size of, of shell script that is, is really quite horrific. It increasingly dominates the compile time because it's all serialized, whereas the rest of the build is parallelized. So with, with high core counts, this is a big problem. So in common with QMU, we're, we're going to be adopting the Mison build system. This is a much simpler syntax to use. It's a domain-specific language, so you'll only, you'll only have to know one language to be able to deal with the build system. If there are limitations, you can still call out to Python to to get things done, but the upstream Mison community is very active and responsive to new features. Has sensible defaults such as parallel compiles, um, only showing you the compiler flags when things go wrong, and, and so on. The only, the only kind of potential downside is that Mison's very new, so it's not in all the distros. You might have to bundle Mison, but 
is better than bundling a 1.8 megabyte shell script from AutoTools. The final thing I want to talk about very, very briefly is, is our development process. We've followed a traditional development process where um, we have a mailing list based patch review submission and review process. I can have a whole talk about the pros and cons of mailing lists versus web based tools, but I just want to focus on things that are impactful for new contributors to the project. If someone has written some code for Libvirt and they want to submit it for review, there are a lot of things that they can get wrong when they're submitting the code to us. I just spent a few minutes thinking about some of the things we've seen in Libvirt, and that's already a big long list there of things that contributors can get wrong. Ultimately, we guide them into how to fix their problems when they do these mistakes, but it's still first impressions matter in a, in a project. The, the, if, if the contributors get these things wrong, they, it's, it's, it's not a good feeling. They may be put off from even sending patches in the first place because they're not confident that they'll do it right. There's, we, can have a, we can have a nice long document telling them exactly how to do this, but it would be much better if, if it was just obvious how to contribute patches in the right way with uh, minimal scope for messing it up. So we've been, we've been seriously considering um, the use of uh, web-based code review tools such as GitLab or GitHub. We haven't made any decisions in this area, but I think it's clear, it's clear to see looking at the open source community in general that these web-based tools have been very widely adopted and projects using mailing lists are, are becoming very much the minority out there. And contributors kind of expect to be able to just kind of send a pull request um, to a project and, and as that, that is kind of the expected interaction model. So we've got, we've got to seriously consider um, that for Libvirt. Like I said, there's, there's, there's pros and cons to the, both these approaches and I don't have time to get into it. But I think it's from a, from a, from a new contributor's point of view, it's, it's, it's a very attractive way to go. For, for, for existing contributors, we may have to do some work on using the remote API service to build some tools to make us more efficient at using something like GitHub or GitLab because code review of 30 patch long series is not that nice through a web UI, but I think these, these are challenges that can be, can be met using, the, using their remote APIs and, and building suitable tools around them. And it also has the other, other nice features that it ties into bug tracking services and CI systems. So we get a nice end to, you can get a nice end-to-end -end workflow, which you kind of, you can cobble that together with, with email, but it's, it's not kind of integrated in the kind of seamless way that you, you see with these, these web-based tools. The exact way we, we may or may not do this is still to be decided. There's, there's active discussions on the mailing list in Libvirt just last week about this topic, so. Watch this space, but don't be surprised if you see this, this happening in the next year in, in Libvert. And uh, with that, we've come to the end pretty much on time, I think. So I, I don't think we really have any time for questions, but if you want to talk about anything, come and find me afterwards, and I'll be publishing a bunch of blog posts expanding on most of these topics over the, over the, coming, over the coming weeks. So keep an eye out for that if you want to learn more about these. Thank you very much.